Hello my little ghosties and ghoulies and goblins. Welcome to Samhain Family Festival, the Shanaki Sessions. Did you know that the traditions of Halloween go all the way back 2,000 years to the festival of Samhain? Now do you know trick or treating, where you get dressed up in your costumes and you go door to door? Well, back in the day, they used to dress up in special costumes to confuse the spirits who would come through on Samhain because the veil between this world and the next was thinnest on that day. And they used to leave treats out on their back doorstep so that the spirits would pass over their house and to the next. Now, Irish people went all over the world and they brought these special traditions with them. Another tradition they brought is that they used to carve turnips. Did you know that there was no pumpkins in Ireland? There was only turnips. Can you imagine? So they'd carve out the turnip and put a scary face in it and they'd put a little light inside on Halloween. Now, my favourite tradition of all is telling spooky stories by the fire. Would you like to hear some spooky stories today? Are you sure? Right, let's go. A great time ago, when the nights were long and dark in Ireland, there lived in Connemara, a woman by the sea. She was the envy of all those who knew her, for her husband was a fisherman, sure and swift in his boat, and brought home plenty of fish for her to sell at market. As his luck increased, she became tormented by cats who were lured by the smell of fish for their supper. They crept into the house any way they could, and she began to keep a large hazel stick to beat the cats back. The cats, of course, did not like her one bit and took to sitting on her window, watching in on her with mischievous glints in their eyes. One winter's night, while her husband was out, there came a knocking on the door. She stood and opened the door and looked out onto a moonless night. The wind shook the trees, but there was nobody there. And so she closed the door and went back to her work carding wool. Straight away, there came another knock and she thought it was the wind and ignored it. When the third knock came, she opened the door and saw an enormous, enormous black cat. He was sitting there at her feet. The cat just looked up and walked into the house and took his ease by the fire. When the woman ran for her stick, the cat remained as he was and watched her. <laughs> with a smile. Then he blinked slowly and licked his lips and said, It is about time you brought me my supper. The woman stared at the cat and was stupefied. She sat down in the chair and rubbed her eyes for she thought she might have fallen asleep by the fire. But when she opened her eyes again, the cat was there, as large as life, with the power of the night gleaming in his black coat. What kind of creature are you, she said, talking to me like that? Oh, surely you must be the devil. It was then she ran at the cat with the stick, but the cat attacked her with a strike of his paw that brought blood to her cheek. That will teach you, he said, to call me names and not show proper respect to a fabulous gentleman like me. Enough now of this carry on, he said, and prepare for me my supper. The woman ran for the door, but the cat was there before her, and so she fled into the bedroom and opened the small window and called out for help to her neighbour. Tom! She said, Tom! Soon enough, old Tom from across the way came banging on the door to help her. What's going on? He shouted. Is everything all right in there? Jesus! 
The woman watched from the bedroom as the cat calmly went to the door and opened it, then flew at the man and tore the man's face with both paws until he could hardly see a thing. He took to his heels into the night, screaming out, he had been attacked by a murderer, a murderer. The cat turned around and licked his lips and blinked slowly again. I hope the fish is good today. After all, this trouble you, lady, are giving me. He climbed up onto the table and yawned, then began to sniff at the fish laid out on two large plates, a fine piece of turbot and two pieces of mackerel. Then he bent his head to eat. The woman watched carefully while the cat was busy eating and making satisfied slurping noises ooh la la she bided her time and then flew at him from across the room with a stick get out of here you wicked beast she cried and struck the cat a blow to the skull that would have killed any other ordinary cat but the black cat merely turned around and grinned at her <laughs> that is no way to treat a gentleman it is time you showed me some respect. It was then he made a sudden leap and tore at her face with his paws. The woman fell away from the cat and lay on the floor. She knew now this was no ordinary cat. This cat was a demon cat sent to take his revenge on her. As the cat continued to eat, he spoke aloud his satisfaction with the fish. <laughs> Yes, he said, this is so very fabulously good. The woman lay very still, wondering what to do. She wiped the blood from her poor eyes with her smock. And it was then she saw the small mirror on the dresser. Without making a sound, she crept across the room and took the mirror down. When the demon cat looked up, <laughs> it met his own reflection and began to smoke like a log on the fire. Then he went up in a puff of smoke and was gone. From that day on, the evil spell had been broken and the cats, wise of them, stayed away from the house and the demon cat was seen no more in that part of Connemara. So be good to your cats, kids, because you don't know what they are. Has anyone ever heard of the Banshee? Well, Banshees are the baddest gals in all of Ireland. Coming across a Banshee is a sign of bad luck and the Banshee is known for bringing people the worst news. There's a few key signs to know if you've come across a Banshee and not just any old ghoul. Banshees look very scary. They dress in black from head to toe. They grow their hair all the way to the ground. Most importantly though, Banshees have to sound scary. Banshees are famous for their horrifying howl. But no two Banshees ever sound the same. Some sound like a wolf when the full moon is high in the sky. Some sound like a kettle whistling when the water is boiling hot. Some sound like a gale forced wind whipping through the trees. Even though every banshee is unique in her own special way, they all have one thing in common. They love giving bad news. Banshees have a superpower, you see. They can see the future. So if something bad is about to happen, the Banshee appears out of nowhere with a terrifying howl to tell you, you're going to step in dog poo today, Woo! And sure enough, later that day, you're walking along the road, minding your own business and squish! Or they'll hide in a tree outside your school and with a withering wail, they'll tell you, you're going to have homework this weekend, Woo! And before you know it, you're knee deep in your eight times tables on a sunny Saturday. Banshees have a wicked sense of humour, you see. They get a kick out of being the bearers of bad news. 
There's nothing more hilarious to the banshee than seeing the look of terror suddenly spread across a smiling face as they give you a shock. But not all banshees are bad. Oh no. This is a story about a banshee who changed the world of scaring forever. Settle in, Babas, and we'll tell you a story about a little banshee named Bridget. Bridget came from a long line of strong and spooky women. Her mammy was a banshee, her granny was a banshee, and her great granny, and her great great granny, and her great great great. I think you get the picture. Every year, the banshees all gather and have a special celebration called Samhain. This has been a banshee tradition for 2,000 years, where they kick off their spooky season. In October, the summer is long over, and the days get shorter and shorter, and the nights get longer and darker. Banshees do their best work in the dead of night, when the moon is nowhere to be found. This year was going to be no different. Every banshee in all of Ireland had spent the whole year combing out their long green hair and practicing their horrifying howls in preparation for the special day. Now Bridget was dreading seven that year. It was a special one for Bridget. It was her 18th birthday, which meant that it was time to sit her scary cert exams. This was the ultimate test for any young banshee to make sure that she had the chops to be the bearer of bad news. There are three tests in the scary cert. Number one, the scariest face. Number two, the horrifying howl. And number three, the test of the dark woods. Bridget was rubbish at all three. No matter how hard she tried, if she tried to look scary, her friendly smile would betray her and she'd end up making friends with the person she was trying to scare. Her howl was more of a friendly, hey, how's it going, than a woeful wail. And most importantly, Bridget was absolutely terrified of the dark. Bridget tried her very best to be scary. She couldn't help it. She hated giving people bad news. When she saw someone who was scared or sad, it made her sad too. Now Bridget's granny, Biddy the Banshee, was at her wit's end. I've never seen anything like it. A Banshee who's afraid of her own shadow. What'll we do with you at all at all? She said as she fussed about the kitchen, making up a potion in her cauldron. Bridget sighed with her head in her hands. I'm sorry, granny. I don't know what to do. I just don't have the nerve to give people bad news. It makes me so sad to see people upset. Granny rolled her eyes as her potion began to froth and bubble. Enough of that nonsense now, girlene, she snapped, taking a long sip of her concoction from a big wooden spoon. Your scary cert is only a few days away and we need to whip you into shape. It's time to pull out the big guns. Right, step one, let's work on your scary face. On the count of three, I want to see your best, twisted, most terrifying face. One two, three. Bridget tried to look terrifying, but all she could do was smile. Can you help Bridget make a scary face? Okay, on the count of three, I want you to show me your best scary faces. You ready? One, two, three. Oh goodness, those are very scary faces. Now, Bridget was getting very frustrated. Ah, Granny, this is no use, she huffed. Being scary just doesn't come naturally to me. Granny pulled a family photo album down from a dusty shelf. She flicked through the pages. Nonsense, Bridget. Look at these photos. You come from a long line of strong and scary women. It's in your bones, my love. You just need to find it. Now, let's work on that horrifying howl. Granny brought Bridget. Granny brought Bridget out to the beach on a blustery day. Bridget could hear the wind whistling. It sent a chill down her spine. Granny told her to listen to the wind and do her very best to copy the sound. But when she tried to sound like a terrifying gust of wind, all that came out was a whimper. Ah, Bridget, get up out of that. You sound like a simple little puppy when you need to sound like a fearsome wolf. Like this. Granny leaned her head back towards the sky and let out an almighty shriek that scared Bridget half to death. She turned on her heels. She turned on her heels, ready to run home, but Granny caught her by the scruff of the neck. Not so fast, Mrs. Magoo, Granny said. I'm not quite done with you yet. There's still the test of the dark woods. This was the part that Bridget was dreading the most. Never mind the fact that she had a big, sweet, friendly face, or the fact that her horrifying howl was more of a yellow-bellied yelp, she was absolutely terrified of the dark. The test of the dark woods was the most important of all. The dark wood was full of ghosties and ghoulies, creepies and crawlies, things that nightmares are made of. Any banshee worth her salt would be able to spend one hour alone in the dark wood without a candle. Granny explained that all she needed to do was spend one hour alone in the woods 
and she'd be well on her way to becoming the baddest banshee in town. Granny wished, Granny wished her luck, gave her a kiss on the cheek, and then disappeared into the trees. Bridget was left alone in the pitch black. The trees were so thick and dense without a single ray of sunlight peeking through the canopy. All was still and silent until Bridget heard a rustling in the hedgerow. Who's there? She called out, trying her best to sound brave. A ghost, a ghoul, a goblin. Whatever you are, I'm not scared of you. I'm a banshee and banshees are the baddest baddies in town. The rustling got louder and closer. Bridget started to sweat. She gave herself a pep talk, remembering the advice that Granny gave her. Deep breaths, Bridget. If anything tries to scare you, you just clap back with a horrifying howl and you'll send them packing. Suddenly, Bridget felt something breathing down her neck. She shrieked like she never shrieked before. She turned on her heels and got ready to run as fast as her legs could carry her when suddenly she heard a familiar laugh. It was Granny rolling around on the forest floor with laughter. <laughs> Jeepers, that was too easy, she cackled. But on a serious note, you have a lot to do before this exam tomorrow, young lady. So get yourself up to the library now and study like you've never studied before. Bridget was in an awful panic. She ran back home to her spooky castle out in the moors and her mind was racing. You're going to fail, Bridget. No one's going to think you're the least bit scary. You're the worst banshee ever. Who's ever heard of a friendly banshee? She rushed up to the library and started pulling out all the books she could to help her cram for her exam. She browsed the shelves, searching high and low for any book that could help. She found Scaring 101, How to Howl and other stories and the Ghoul's Guidebook. As she was perusing the library, she stumbled across a book she'd never seen before. It was bound in gold and it almost looked like it was glowing, inviting her to pick it up and read it. The title was written in old-fashioned curly writing, The Good News Banshee. Bridget looked down at the cover. There was a photograph of a banshee with the sunniest, friendliest face Bridget had ever seen. She was carrying something. Bridget looked closer. It was a bag of letters. Bridget leafed through the book and was enthralled by the story. It told of a banshee long ago who hated giving bad news and frightening people. So she decided to leave the banshee traditions of howling and pulling scary faces and put all that behind her to become a postwoman. What a genius idea, thought Bridget. Even if I can't escape giving people bad news, at least I could do it in a friendly way. Bridget was overjoyed. She couldn't believe the discovery she'd just made. She ran down to Granny, who was having a nice cup of tea in the sitting room. Granny, look, she cried. Granny almost jumped out of her skin. Granny almost jumped out of her skin. Ah, for spook's sake, Bridget, you nearly scared me there. Nearly being the key word. Bridget could barely speak, she was so excited. She hopped in beside Granny, proudly showing her the good news banshee. To her surprise, Granny didn't seem too excited. Ah, you mean your great Granny Bernadette? Ah, she was a real rebel now. She never howled, always had a smile on her face, and she hated giving bad news, Granny replied nonchalantly. Bridget gave Granny a quizzical look. Eh, uh, does that not remind you of anyone, Granny? She asked. Granny smiled softly at her. It does surely, a store, but it's very important for every banshee to find her own path. With a little help, of course. Bridget was overjoyed. She started bouncing up and down on the sofa. Does this mean I don't have to take the scary cert tomorrow? She shrieked with glee. Granny giggled and leapt up on the couch to give her a big hug. Yes, love, you're off the hook, she beamed. If you have a dream of your own, you have to follow it. You can't spend your life trying to make other people happy if it makes you miserable. But get yourself down to that post office first thing tomorrow and see if they have any jobs delivering the post. So the very next morning, as all the young banshees were stressed out gearing up to take their exams, our Bridget was cool as a cucumber. She strolled into the local post office and asked Mrs McLaughlin for a job delivering the post. Mrs McLaughlin looked a little confused. Are you sure you want to deliver post for a living? She asked. Bridget beamed and said, I've never been more sure of anything in my life. So from then on, Bridget ditched her scary black clothes for a postwoman's uniform. She spent her days strolling around her neighbourhood, delivering letters full of all kinds of news. Good news, bad news, it didn't matter. Bridget always rocked up with a friendly smile on her face. Everyone from miles around knew about the good news banshee who learned that no matter who you are or what you do, you can always follow your dreams. The Piper and the Puka in the days of old, there lived a man who was half a fool and who thought himself a great piper, though he could only play one tune. 
He went around with his cap before him, playing the black rogue over and over, and the gentlemen in the drinking shops used to get a great laugh out of him. One night, the piper walked home a little drunk after playing music at a dance. The wind was up and clouded the moon, and to keep his hands warm, he began to play the pipes. He took a shortcut through a field that would lead him to his mother's house. The field was black before him and he could not see his feet. And he was halfway along when a gust of wind flung him onto his back. The man closed his eyes and refused to open them for he knew this was no wind at all but the goings on of the puka. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing before him but the long, cold horns that had tossed him onto his back. It was the pooker indeed, the greatest trickster in Ireland and the bringer of both good and bad fortune. He turned away in fear and roared at the top of his voice, Leave me be, you brute. The few quid I have is for my mother, and you're not getting none of it. It was then that the pooka spoke with a bale for breath that smelt like some wild animal from a field. Grab a hold of my horns, the pooka said, for I need a piper tonight, and we're going for a long ride. The piper found himself flying through the air as he was tossed onto the puka's back. And as they raced through the field, the puka said, Play me the tune of Sean Van Vocht. I haven't heard that in the longest while. But the piper did not know how to play it. I only know one tune, he said. Let me play you the black rogue instead. Never mind that, said the puka. Blow the pipes as though you know the song, and I will place the tune in your head. When the man began to play the pipes, the sweetest music came out of them. Tonight, said the puka, we're going to Crow Patrick to a feast in the house of the Bonshee, and though it's a long way to go, you'll be well paid for your trouble. As Ireland lay under the shadow of night, they flew across the hills and the boglands, and in no time at all they had reached the top of Crowpatrick. The puka struck three blows with his horn at the door of the house of the Bonshee, and it opened onto a room that did not seem to belong to the mountain at all. Inside, the piper saw hideous old women with long streaming hair sitting round a great table. We bid you welcome, said one of the banshee, taking a comb from her hair. Who is this you have brought to our door? For your feast tonight, the puka said, I have brought you the greatest piper in Ireland. A strange energy entered into the piper's hands as he began to play, and he knew every song in the land. The Banshee women began to dance and did not let up until sunrise. When the feast was over, the puka tossed the piper onto his back. Come along now, said the puka. It's time we got home, but first the piper must be paid. At that, the Banshee women he's each placed a coin into the piper's hand, and he stamped his foot and shouted aloud, I am as rich as the son of a lord. As Ireland came under the light of the sun, they flew across the hills and boglands, and in no time at all, the puka dropped him off at the edge of the field in front of his mother's house. The piper knocked on his mother's door and woke up from my bed. Let me in, he said. I'm as rich as the son of a lord, and I'm the greatest piper in Ireland. His mother opened the door and met him with a scornful look. You're drunk, she said, and you're covered in muck. Go wash and go to bed. But the piper stood before her and shook his head. Not until you hear the music I have to play. He brought up the pipes and began to play, but instead of sweet music, an awful screech and clatter came out of them, and his mother fell around laughing at him. And what about your great wealth? she said. 
I suppose you're going to buy me a new house? She watched the piper reach into his pockets, but all he could find were stones covered in muck. You're some fool for a mother to have to put up with, she said. Now, go to bed and don't wake me up again. The end. A rich woman sat up late one night preparing wool while her family and servants were asleep. There was a knock at the door and a voice called out, Open! Open! And the woman stood up afraid. Who's there? she called. And a voice called back, The Witch of One Horn. The woman could not stop her hands nor her feet and she found herself opening the door. A dark-looking woman entered the house and went to the fire and sat down. She had on her head a single horn, and in her hand she held a wool carder. Without a word, she began to card wool, and then she looked up and spoke. Where are the others? They're supposed to be here. Of a sudden, there was another knock, and a voice called out. Open! Open! The woman of the house, again, could not stop her body from moving towards the door. A second witch, this time with two horns, came in and in her hand was a spinning wheel. I'm the witch of two horns, she said. Please find me a seat. And with that, she sat beside the fire. The knocks continued all night and the door was opened and the witches entered the house until there were 12 of them seated around the fire, and the last one to enter had 12 horns. Can you imagine? They carded wool and turned their spinning wheels and sang an ancient rhyme the woman could not understand. She watched them and was unable to move and felt that something terrible had come upon her. She tried to call to her family, but she couldn't use her voice. Then one of the witches called out, Go, woman, and make us a cake. The woman searched for a vessel to bring water from the well so that she might mix the meal and make the cake, but no matter where she looked, she couldn't find any. The witch with twelve horns told her to take the sieve, and so she went outside with the sieve to the well, but she couldn't carry any water in it. She could not do what the witches asked, so she sat down and wept. Then she heard a voice speaking as though from inside the well itself. It was the spirit of the spring who had taken pity on her. Take some yellow clay and some moss and bind them together and plaster it inside the sieve and it will hold water. The woman did as she was told and then the spirit of the spring told her how to protect herself and her family from the witches. And now that you have your water, go to the house and stand at the north wall and shout, the mountain of the women and the sky above it is on fire. The woman heard herself calling out as though she was in a strange dream. A terrible howling broke from the mouths of the witches and they fled shrieking from the house. When the woman stepped back inside, she washed the feet of her children and poured the water over the threshold of the house. Then she went to the cake and saw that the witches had not used the water at all to bind it. And she would not, could not wake her children. She smashed the cake into pieces and placed a piece in the mouth of each sleeper and soon they were restored to their powers. Then, following the advice of the spirit of the spring, the woman went to the dark shawl that the witches had woven and placed half of it inside a chest and the other half without and locked it with a padlock. Finally, she took a crossbeam and she put it across the door. It wasn't long before the witches returned and they raged and called for vengeance. Open, they screamed, open water, this has been poured at this door. I cannot, said the water. I'm scattered all over the ground. Open, they roared, open wood and tree placed across this door. I can't, said the beam, for I'm fixed firmly bef before the door and I cannot move. Open, they shouted, open cake that we made with blood. I can't, said the cake, for I am broken and I've been given to the lips of the children. 
the witches rattled the door as though a great storm had come upon the house, but they could not get in. They rushed about the air with great cries, and then they were away, gone to Slyvnaman, the mountain of the women. And from that night on, they never returned. Long ago, in the dark ages of Ireland, there lived in County Derry a cruel chieftain by the name of Aurtach. The man, it was said, was a blackguard and a sorcerer, and he was hated by his people for the way he treated them. When there was a famine on the land, he continued to take from them a portion of the harvest as tax. When their children were born, he demanded a price. When their daughters were to be married, he demanded they first visit his house, where he took from them a piece of their treasure. This tyrant is sucking our blood and bleeding us dry, the people said. But they were afraid of doing him harm because it was said he had magical powers. But the day came when the people had enough, and two men left the lands of Aurtach and visited a neighbouring chieftain called Cahan, who was great in war but kind to his people. We need this cruel man dead, they said, and we'll pay any price if you can help us. I never liked Aurtach and the way he treated his people, Cahan said. So I will do this for you myself. But the price I want you to pay is that you will place a great stone on Aurtach's grave as a monument to his tyranny so that the people will never forget him. A deal was made and Cahan came to Aurtach's lands and waited for him under a hawthorn tree. Aurtach passed by, rubbing his hands, and it was then that the chieftain struck him. Down went Aurtach, and the people buried him that night, six feet in the ground, and there were cries of joy in the land. But the next morning, Aurtach was back, as though no harm had been done to him, and he came knocking on the door of every house with an empty bowl. You said I was bleeding you dry, he said. Now I will show you the meaning of that. The people didn't know what to do, and so they filled his bowl. But word soon reached Cahan, and he returned with an axe in hand. He waited again under the hawthorn tree and felled Aurtach with one powerful blow, then dropped him into a hole 12 feet in the ground and buried him. That'll be the end of you now, he said. But the next morning, Aurtach was back as though no harm had been done to him. And this time, his anger was worse. When I came around with my bowl, he said, you filled it half full last time, but that's not good enough for me now. This time, you will fill my bowl to the brim. The people didn't know what to do, and so they filled the bowl, and the people began to grow sick. Word reached Cahan, who grew upset that this was still going on, and he went to visit an old druid for his wisdom. That Aurtach is a dangerous man, the druid said, and he's making use of his sorcerer's powers. The only way to stop his magic and get rid of him for good is to kill him with a sword made of yew wood and to bury him upside down. The next day, Cahan called to Aurtach's house and found him drinking from his bowl. Aurtach looked him up and down with a bloody smile and said, What is it you have planned for me now? Cahan felled him there and then before Aurtach had time to stand up, and he took the body to a grave on a hill and buried him upside down. From that day on, Aurtach's magic was gone, and he was never seen again. Today, if you dare to do so, you can visit his place of burial on a hill under a lone hawthorn tree where a red blossom grows and falls onto a great dolmen that lies on top of the grave. If you dare. I wouldn't. Watch this game. This is a story called The Haunting of Seafield House. 
100 years ago, in County Sligo, there stood a mansion of 23 rooms that overlooked the sea. It was known as Seafield House and belonged to a man of considerable wealth called Owen Phibbs, who was famed at the time as an archaeologist. Owen Phibbs began to fill his house with exotic treasures from his adventures in the Far East, Syria and Egypt, and he placed these objects on the first floor of his house that came, became known as the museum. It was said that many of the items were cursed because of the way they had been taken as plunder. And among these treasures were many Egyptian artifacts, including some mummies which had been stolen from the pyramids. There were whisperings that the mummies were cursed and that a mummy disturbed from its place of burial becomes an unhappy, vengeful spirit. But Owen Phibbs was having none of that. He brought his friends to his house and they marveled at his vast collection and they looked at the mummies on the first floor of his house and they laughed at them in their strangeness. And that was when things started to go wrong. Rare china and delf that had survived from the ancient world began to fly off the shelves. Owen Phibbs, in a rage, began to blame the servants and one of them was sent away from the house. Then, one night, another servant saw a strange figure on the stairs and that sighting was soon followed by crashing and banging in the museum. Pottery from ancient Syria was smashed into pieces and the master's exotic knives had been pulled from the wall. And it was said that some of them had blood on them. Some of the servants would not return to work the next day. Soon after, the gardener fled the house for good, terrified by the shadowy figure he had seen walking the grounds with an evil, loud laugh. The rest of the servants grew afraid. The house began to shake at night and people were terrified in their beds that the house was going to fall down on top of them. The next day, every servant in that house fled and would never work there again. Seafield House began to have a reputation as a place that was cursed and Owen Phibbs could not find anybody to work there. He called the priest to get rid of any spirits but the priest could not get rid of them and the hauntings continued. Owen Phibbs was a stubborn man and he denied there was any problem at all. He changed the name from Seafield House to Lysheen House to conceal its past and he brought up servants from Dublin to work there who were unafraid of the house's reputation. But within a week or two, they were all gone. Then, one night, without a word ever spoken about it, the Phibbs family fled the house, never to return. No one knows what happened that night. But it is said that Owen Phibbs was a changed man after that. Auctioneers came and took all the exhibits from the house, including the Egyptian mummies, and everything was sold to buyers around the world. What happened to those mummies? And where they went? Nobody knows. But the house began to lie unoccupied, and it soon went to ruin. Today, Seafield House lies without a roof and is covered in trees and wild ivy. And if you go there at night and listen, that sound of laughter can be heard coming from the walls, might not be wind at all. The Dullahan. The night was dark and fierce with rain and Charlie Cullen could not see the road. He rode his horse along the banks of the black water, clutching at his oilskin hat. He was late and he knew it, for he had stopped too long at the pub while his wife waited back home for the sultanas and raisins packed into his bag from which she would make the barn brack. As Charlie rode, he looked towards the quarter moon in the hope it would break free and brighten the road. He began to whistle an old song and he called to his horse and gave it praise and it was then he heard what sounded like a whispering sound behind him. The rain was pounding the earth and as he turned around, but it was too dark to see, so he rode on thinking his mind was playing tricks on him. The whispering continued and he thought he could hear a horse behind him, but he was too afraid to look. As a boy, he had heard tales of the Dullahan appearing along this road, but he didn't believe them. It was said the headless rider on a black horse drew out your soul by calling your name. You've had too much to drink, he thought, and he hurried along, but the mare grew nervous under him and he called to her to hold steady. 
It was then he heard his name being called in a commanding voice that chilled him to the bone. The moon had broken free and shed blue light on the road. He told himself not to look and he closed his eyes. And then he turned around and he saw the dull hand bearing down on him. The horseman rode a towering black horse without stirrups and carried his head under his arm. And what Charlie Cullen saw in that head was the worst thing he had ever seen. The mouth was stretched into a hideous grin that reached both sides of the skull. The eyes, they weren't the eyes of a human at all. And they were wriggling in their sockets while the flesh on the head had taken a look at clotted cheese left out for months. The mouth of the headless rider licked its lips with a horrid long tongue and he called out, Charlie Cullen, you are coming with me tonight. Charlie didn't stop, but he nudged his horse into a canter. I can't help you there, he said. I have to get these sultanas home for me wife. She'll kill me if I don't. <laughs> we'll see about that, the Dullahan said. I'll go with you if I have to, Charlie said, but please just let me place a bet with you first. Let us race this night to Mizzen Head, and if I beat you there, you'll let me go. He was looking down at the Dullahan's hideous head, and he saw it smile as though it knew there could only be one outcome. But what the headless rider couldn't know was that Charlie Cullen's mare was a champion hurdler, and there wasn't a steeplechase or a fox hunt in the land in which Charlie didn't come first. Charlie's horse pulled at the reins, impatient to be off. And then Charlie was off at a gallop, and the headless horseman followed, unaided by whip or spoor. And soon they were neck and neck, and they rode the dark night and pounded the earth, and Charlie grew afraid for his horse. They tore through the fields of the winter crops and raced through farmyards while dogs howled and birds shook awake and grew confused thinking the moon was the sun. They followed the winding roads toward Mizzen Head and Charlie saw his eyes squirming in the skull and that gruesome mouth grinning at him. Charlie Cullen, the headless horseman said, your luck has run out tonight. And it was then, before them, the road split in two as the Dullahan was racing ahead. Which way is it now? The headless horseman called out. I have not been down this way before. Charlie Cullen leaned even lower into his horse, dug in his heels, and he called out, It's the right turn there! The other road leads you wrong! With that, the Dullahan swerved right, and he carried on, but Charlie Cullen kept left, and he raced on, letting out a great laugh, for he was on the right road all along. And then it was before him, the southernmost point of Ireland, and he brought the horse to a stop and turned around, and could see neither headless rider nor horse behind him, to the east, the sea was red with blood of the winter sun and the road remained silent behind him. Charlie Cullen waited like that, watching the mist rise from the sea and the new day rise before him. He was miles from home, but he didn't care. He'd won the race with the Dullahan and from that day on, the headless horseman did not trouble him.